Well, welcome everyone to episode one, part one. This is Jason with Focus Creative Studio. In this episode, we're going to go ahead and jump into uh, the basics of 3D printing guidelines for resin printers today. This is the first of a two-part series where we're just going to cover the guidelines, and then the follow-up video will be on using these guidelines and developing the brick patterns and options that you see in our banner image here for episode one. All right, so this time we're going to run through the generally accepted guidelines for 3D printing, and we're going to spend our time focused on the resin printing guidelines for today in this episode. So this, this document was put together by 3D Hubs quite some time ago, and has been a great resource for modelers and printers to reference on the tolerances that you can generally expect uh, to, to be good for achieving successful prints. So that's really where we're going to start today and make sure that we understand each one of these um, categories as they relate to how we do our models. So you'll see in this document that the very first column is called supported walls. And just what it says is walls that are connected and you can get pretty good detail, but the minimum width that they recommend is 0.5 millimeters. Now I've experimented with this uh, quite a bit and I can tell you that you can get to 0.4 millimeters fairly consistently without having issues as long as your geometry is spot on. You'll, you'll run into issues if you've got flipped faces and double geometry regardless, and in that case you'll have to run it through a mesh mixer or 3D Builder uh, to flip those faces and correct your model. But this is a great rule of thumb uh, to go by when you're developing models. The second one is unsupported walls. So these are going to be you know thin layers of walls just like it shows here that are cantilevered off a main face. And the recommendation here is one millimeter in width. Now part of this is going to be contingent upon how far that unsupported wall sticks off away from uh, the object that it's attached to. You can certainly do uh, down to 0 0.5, 0 0.6 unsupported walls, as long as you're not uh, getting out past probably one to two millimeters. But that, again, is just gonna depend on how well uh, you do with supporting the file for that type of situation where you might have an overhang. Uh, which brings us to the next one, which is support and overhangs. This talks about with SLA, any overhang you have is always required. This is a little bit incorrect. What where, where supports are always required is going to be with what are called islands. And islands are areas that say in this particular example, if this edge out here dropped down and was left hanging there, that would be an island. It's not connected to the main part of the model, and therefore it needs to have a support placed underneath it so that when the print gets to that level, your support underneath picks it up and includes it as part of the model. You can go, uh, I've done stuff honestly as low as about 15 degrees as long as it's not a large model. With small details at HO scale, like my Transformer series, uh, the bushings were all 10, 15 degree angles on the bottom side, and those things print just fine. The, the 45 degree rule for FDM applies to resin if you don't want to deal with that additional uh, lift force that starts pulling on the outside edge of your model. The next one is embossed and engraved detail. This one at 0.4 millimeters wide is, is pretty good. You can do some things at 0.3 millimeters and even down to 0.2, but then it starts getting into the angle that you place your print on the plate and the quality of your exposure time, resin settings, temperature, all the things outside of model development that start affecting the quality of the print. You can get some really fine detail, but you need a really, really well dialed in printer in order to do that. So the 0.4 millimeter wide is a great general rule of thumb for those that probably aren't printing every day for 6, 8, 12, 14 hours a day with multiple prints to really experience where you can test it. If you're just going to throw a random model on the plate that you've picked up from somewhere else, hopefully the model that was created was done with these standards. Next one is bridging, horizontal bridging. Says that you, you can't 
it it's, doesn't give you a recommendation in resin, that's because it's really a trial and error. You need to start look once you get into figuring out supports, you really need to start looking at how often to place a support underneath that bridge to keep it from sagging. I do this all the time with railings and HO scale. It is possible. You just have to learn how to do supports manually. You cannot rely on auto supports to do that. Next one up is holes. Holes within the objects that you create or holes that were created by someone else. This is spot on unless you have a very well dialed in printer. 0.5 millimeters is really the smallest quality detailed hole you're going to get in resin. I do 0.4 on occasion, but then it comes down again. It's your resin settings. It's your post-processing and getting all that resin out of those little bitty holes that you're creating. Much easier to do back on the engraved side because you can use a small, small bristle brush, you know, fine bristle brush, and wipe that resin off. It's just harder to get it out of the smaller holes. But it can be done, but 0.5 millimeters is a great, great, great uh, spot to be at. And then the next one, moving parts, pins, connections. Again, 0.5 millimeters is the, the recommended clearance between the edge. So if you're going to develop a pin like I've done for some models, you need to offset that 0.5 millimeters for a fairly clean edge. And that, that number does work well. I use it all the time for my pin connection. Sometimes I even go up to 0.6 just so there's a little bit more leeway. Next one is escape holes. This one's huge. If you're grabbing files from somebody else on Thingiverse or 3D Colts or, or any of the other, you know, model sites out there, even paid sites, if you get a solid model and you need to hollow it, they're saying the minimum hole diameter is four millimeters. And I'm going to tell you, if you can make it bigger, please do. Because this is where your your vent is going to happen when you're close to the build plate and any drainage so that you get all the resin out of the inside of the model. This is probably the top reason most prints uh, crack and fail post-processing is because that hole's not big enough and you can't get all the resin out of there and you can't get inside to cure it unless you're using a small LED light um, that's specifically designed to go inside hollow models to do that. Lots of hurdles with this. I try and avoid solid models and you'll notice in a lot of my work that I, I really, I spend most of my time working with the smaller details. Next one up is the minimum features. It, this one's 0.2 millimeters, uh, ties back into some of the engraving and, and holes and things that you can develop a part that's 0.2 millimeters in size and diameter. It, it will print. It just it becomes very delicate, and you just need to be aware of that, that when you're post-processing, if you're not using, well, even with IPA, it can be a little hot. It can warp and bend some of those things. If you have long, stringy tubes or pieces like this that are against a model but not connected to the model. So point two works. Next one is pin diameter, 0.5. Again, this is back to holes being 0.5. You can do 0.4 all day long. I've done 0.4 pin diameters. They work. Um, not nearly as big an issue. Now, you don't want to start stretching this thing two, three, four millimeters off the plate. That gets back to your unsupported walls piece. But a general rule of thumb is the, the diameter of your pin, you can go twice as high off your part without any issues. Beyond that, it's just it's how you orient the model and where you support it. And then the last one is tolerances. This one's a big one because most of the the parts that you're going to get, they'll measure out in in one of the programs. You know, even on your build plate, it'll tell you X millimeters tall. It's not going to be that tall unless you've changed the screen size and tricked your printer into calibrating this very issue. It's it's always going to run somewhere between about 0.5 and 2% is what I found um, with a couple of printers that I've had at least that y you need to, if you really are working on needing dimensionally accurate pieces, which I in the model railroad industry, it's not that critical other than when you start getting into, you know, potentially printing out locomotive shells and in car bodies and stuff, then it becomes, you know, much more critical, obviously. But for the general modeling stuff, this is going to be a non-issue. You really won't even have to deal with it much. So you either need to go through, calibrate your plate settings, or you need to adjust the model. And so when you're adjusting the model, you just take whatever the percentage is. Normally it's the Z-axis is that's your, what's your issue, and you scale your model up to compensate for it if it's that important to you.
So it's just a generally good practice to, to, to understand what these limits are so that specifically when you start downloading models from somebody else, which I know a lot of people are doing, they've not specifically modeled uh, the, 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 the piece that you've got based on these standards. A lot of modelers do. But what you're finding is that a lot of modelers that are new to modeling or are not doing this specifically for model railroading at HO scale, which is what I focus on, they're modeling in full scale or half scale, and then, then they're scaling their model down. And so what happens is, is you might model a bunch of beautiful detail in at a half an inch or an inch in dimension at full scale, and it's just not going to translate down to an HO scale model and hold the detail because of these specific, basically, guidelines or rules, per se, on what your printer can achieve. So I think that's probably the number one hurdle that most people are up against is, is when they're not doing their own modeling, is, is you're dependent on the modeler to have, uh, you know, basically accounted for all these settings so that when you drop it into your build plate, you can ensure a successful print. Most of the time, you're going to have some good quality models out there um, that just just miss the mark by a touch, and so you start missing some detail. But but if you're a modeler or getting into modeling, it doesn't matter what program you're using. These tolerances need to be basically part of your workflow and understanding as you're developing models. All right, everyone, I hope that information was helpful to you. Um, if you enjoyed the content, please hit the like button and subscribe below. I've got the next episode hopefully rolling out by the weekend for how I developed the HO scale brick for the Dynamic Preservation Model Modular Series. Until then, go build something.